Okay, uh, so let's get started. Uh, as Davida said, I will be talking about promises, but before I do that, I want to give some background for this talk because I assume that not all of you will be familiar with promises. And the background is going to be about uh, how to deal with asynchrony. And until promises were around, uh, the main way to deal with asynchrony in JavaScript was through event-driven programming. Uh, so I'll give some examples, and uh, then we'll come to promises. I'll tell you what they are and how you use them in JavaScript. And then I'll get to the contributions of our paper, which is going to be a formal model for reasoning about promises. And uh, the promise graph, which is a data structure that we introduced, uh, that is uh, aimed at helping programmers with finding errors in promise-based uh, JavaScript code. And then I'll conclude and I'll give some directions for future work. So uh, this is a, a running example that I'll be using uh, in the remainder of this talk. It's a small example uh, involving an XML HTTP request written in JavaScript using traditional event-driven programming. Uh, let's just quickly look at what this uh, code uh, looks like. So at the top we have two functions that are invoked when uh, either a correct response is received for an HTTP request or if an error has occurred. Uh, in the middle you can see there's some code for creating and initializing an HTTP request object and uh, initializing it. Uh, then, very importantly, we have to associate event handlers with the load and error events uh, and make sure that uh, when that happens, the uh, handle response and handle error functions at the top will be invoked. And lastly, uh, we call send on the uh, HTTP request object in order to send a request. Uh, so that's what uh, the code looks like. And now let's look at how it would execute. So uh, what happens is that after you have created the request and registered the event handlers and sends uh, the request. Uh, after some time goes by, a response will be uh, received. And let's assume in this case that the, on, the, the load event will be received. So that will trigger the uh, on load event handler, which will then invoke the handle response function at the top. So the details are not very important, but the key takeaway here is that execution order is very nonlinear. It's very difficult for programmers to keep track of what's going on because you have these uh, creation and emission of events in one place and handlers being triggered uh, in possibly a very different location in the code. So this makes event-driven programs uh, hard to reason about. Uh, a second issue is if you want to uh, enforce some order on uh, performing certain operations, in sequential code it's very simple. You just uh, sequentially organize them with semicolons. Uh, in event-driven event -driven programs that becomes a lot more complicated because the only way you can enforce uh, an order between asynchronous operations is by nesting one event handler inside of another. And that leads to something that is sometimes referred to as callback hell, which is very unpleasant because it leads to this deeply nested code that becomes really difficult to read. Uh, then there's some issues uh, with error handling in event-driven code. Um, here's a small example that shows two buttons in a, in a web page. Um, I have set things up so that when you invoke the onClick handler for the first button, an exception occurs. Uh, but then after uh, that exception has occurred, this being JavaScript, control flow will just go back to the top level. And then you can happily click on the second button and it will just execute as if nothing happened. And basically there's no awareness of the fact that an exception occurred earlier because each event handler is invoked separately from the top level. So that means there's very poor support for error handling. So then there's further problems with event-driven programming, uh, namely problems such as lost events and dead listeners, which we covered in an earlier Uppsala paper. So this happens, for example, when you emit an event before the handler has been registered, or if you possibly mistype the name of an event that can cause event handlers to become unreachable. And then lastly, there's other problems like event race errors, which is a very active area of research. There's been many papers in recent years on uh, detecting these problems, which happen when you have uh, non-deterministic behavior depending on the order in which event handlers uh, happen to execute. So I think it's clear from all these problems that event-driven programming is a very problematic way of dealing with asynchrony, and that's where promises come in. Promises are uh, an old concept. I think the earliest paper that I could find is by Friedman and Weiss from 1976. And a promise is basically an object that represents uh, the result of a, a future uh, asynchronous computation. Sometimes these are referred to as futures. <clears throat> Excuse me. A promise is always in one of three states. It's either pending, which is when it's created, uh, 
or it's fulfilled, and that always happens with a specific value, or it is rejected, and that also happens with a specific value. And uh, if a promise is either fulfilled or rejected, we also refer to that as being settled. And once a promise is settled, it can never change state again. So it's really a one-time switch from pending state to settled state. So now what does this look like in JavaScript? Uh, what I'm showing you here is a snippet of code that shows how to create a promise by invoking the promise constructor, which is uh, defined in the uh, ECMAScript 6 uh, specification. Uh, you basically call that promise constructor with a function that takes two other functions as arguments, resolve and reject. And if you want to resolve the promise, you invoke resolve with a value as an argument. And if you want to reject it, you invoke that reject function with a value as an argument. So in this example here, where uh, I'm making a non-deterministic choice, the promise will either be resolved with the value 17 or it will be rejected with the value 18. So that's one way of creating promises. In more realistic codes, what happens is you basically call an API of a, uh, uh, of a, of a library, like a file system API, that will then return a promise, and that's sometimes referred to as promiseification. And you can apply that to many APIs, for example, the Node.js file system API. You can get a promise-based version of that uh, that you can use. So once you have created promises, either by calling the promise constructor or by calling an API function, um, you can then uh, associate reactions with promises. And that is done by invoking a function called then. And you give that function then two arguments. One is uh, resolve reaction, which is invoked when the promise uh, is successfully uh, resolved. And uh, the other second argument is a reject reaction, which is going to be uh, invoked if that promise is rejected. So in this example here, if the first promise was resolved with the value 17, we basically invoke uh, that what would happen then is the resolve reaction would be uh, executing and it would return the value 19. And the way this handle, uh, is handled in JavaScript, the result of then is another promise. So if you return a value in one of these reactions, it will be wrapped in a new promise. And what that allows you to do is it can uh, let you chain promises in a sequence of uh, reactions like the one I'm showing you here, where you have an initial promise, you invoke uh, then on it to uh, create a dependent promise, and then when that promise resolves, you can have another reaction being executed. And what you can do furthermore is you can uh, add a uh, catch uh, at the end, and that would be, uh, it's a construct that is very similar to then, but it only has a reject reaction, and that will be uh, executing if any of the promises in the preceding block, in this case, is rejected. So this provides for a mechanism to have uh, error handling in a sequence of asynchronous operations that you construct with these uh, promises. And in a way, this looks somewhat similar to exception handling uh, with a try-catch block. And uh, the uh, basic idea is here that once you have promises, you can construct an example like what I showed you earlier with this HTTP request in a much nicer way. In this case, I'm showing you here an example using uh, a module from the Node.js system called Node Fetch uh, that gives you a function fetch. If you give it a URL, it will return a promise and when the response to the HTTP request comes in, that promise will be resolved with that response value as its value. And then you can uh, chain that with operations like I showed you in the earlier example, and you get a very nice linear execution order and proper error handling, which is something you didn't get with that previous model for uh, asynchronous programming uh, using event-driven programming. So that all sounds great, right? Uh, so what's the matter with promises? Well, some people get really confused by these promises. So if you go to Stack Overflow, you see uh, some promises, uh, I mean some problems with promises. So there's actually a lot of them and people really struggle quite a bit with this concept. So uh, what we set out to do in this project was we wanted to build a static analysis or a dynamic analysis for finding issues in promise-based JavaScript code. And uh, to do that, uh, uh, let me first mention a few of the problems that we observed when we studied these uh, Stack Overflow reports. So we found issues like uh, unexpected breaks in the chain of promises, uh, promises that were never resolved or rejected, or promises that were resolved or rejected, but only on certain paths uh, through, the, through the program. Uh, we saw attempts where to resolve a promise a second time, um, and several other problems that I'm listing here. So uh, 
after we studied that, we decided, well, let's build an analysis to, uh, to find these problems. But then uh, we hit another problem, um, namely, the semantics of promises are quite complex, and there isn't really anything beyond uh, the ECMAScript specification out there to really understand what it is that they do. So there's an entire chapter 25.4 devoted to promises, which is, I think, about 20 pages of informal text. It is highly complex. Uh, it is also written at a fairly low level technically, mostly as a guide for implementers. And it wasn't really suitable for formal reasoning. And uh, some of the issues that we found there is there's uh, multiple objects involved in a single promise. So the spec distinguishes between a promise and a promise capability, for example. Uh, the then operation that we saw in the earlier examples is heavily overloaded. Uh, for example, if you give it a non-function as an argument, uh, that is interpreted as an identity function. Um, also, if you return a value in a reaction that gets wrapped in a promise, but if a reaction returns a promise, then basically you still return a new promise, but that new promise is linked to the promise that is being returned by the reaction. Uh, so that if one is resolved, the other one is resolved, and is, if one is rejected, then the other one is rejected. And there's also uh, the issue that if one of the reactions throws an exception, that is interpreted as a rejection of the promise. And then there's various other operations in addition to then and catch that we've seen, such as all and race, which gives you various uh, mechanisms for dealing with synchronization, such as uh, effectively barrier synchronization. So that is all quite complex. And uh, what we decided to do was let's focus on a core subset. Um, and the uh, model that we decided to base our semantics on is uh, Lambda JS by Arjun Gua and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, we made a small addition to Lambda.js with the uh, uh, elements that you see on the left here. So we have a feature for creating a promise, for resolving and rejecting a promise, for uh, adding a resolve or reject reaction to a promise. So that's the equivalent of then and catch. And we have a link operation to handle the case where one promise is, is linked to another one where to handle that case where you have a promise being returned in a, in a reaction. Uh, we have a small step reduction semantics that I'm not going to tell you much about, other than that it's basically uh, a one step relation that takes uh, you from, uh, that basically transitions a heap to a new heap, an old promises state to a new promises state. Uh, it updates the set of fulfill reactions and reject reactions, and it keeps track of a queue of scheduled reactions that need to be executed. Then a uh, second contribution of our work is uh, we defined something that we call the promise graph, which is a data structure that uh, reflects relationships between values, promises, and functions. Uh, so the nodes are values, promises, and functions, and the edges are uh, resolve, reject edges between values and promises, registration edges when you register a function as a reaction for a promise, link edges to handle that case where you have two linked promises and return edges when a function returns a value. <coughs> and then what you can do is for a small example written in our core calculus, you can create a promise graph like the one I'm showing you here. In this case, we create a promise on line one, we add a resolve reaction to it on line two, and then we resolve the promise on line three. And that would result in a promise graph that looks like this, where we have the value on line three being resolved to uh, being used to resolve the promise on line one. Uh, we have the function on line two being registered as a resolve reaction for that promise. Uh, the function returns a value, which is then uh, reflected in that edge you see over here. And then lastly, uh, the last value is used to resolve the dependent promise that is created by the on resolve operation. So next to what we did is we took those uh, stack overflow examples that we looked at earlier. And uh, we decided to study if we construct promises promise graphs for these examples, how would that help us in debugging the problems? And there were, I think, 21 cases that we studied. This is one of them. Uh, and these are usually quite uh, detailed uh, bits of code. So it uh, took some manual studying to understand what was really the problem. In this case, this was a programmer complaining that his promise was resolved with the value undefined, and that led to other problems. Um, the issue is that in line 20 here, there's a call to a function bcrypt.compare, which returns a promise. Uh, however, that function call is not being returned there. It's just an expression. So what happens is that when that function terminates, it returns undefined, which is the default return value uh, you have in JavaScript. Uh, 
and that led to the problem. And what you see on the right here is the promise graph that, would be, that could be constructed for this example. And you can see there is no connection. There's two disjoint chains. And what the programmer wanted to do is to explicitly return that expression bcrypt to com dot compare, and that would have resulted in an edge between P21 and P16. So uh, we studied uh, 21 cases. Uh, we found that in all but five of them, I think we could uh, analyze the problem from the promise graph alone. Uh, in the remaining cases, some additional information was needed beyond the promise graph to really fully understand what was going on. For example, if you have multiple promises being created in a loop where one depends on another, I think two of the benchmark required such information, and I refer you to the paper for uh, more details. Um, but in most cases, we found that the promise graph would be really helpful in uh, debugging these kinds of problems. So to conclude, um, we uh, developed a formal model of JavaScript promises, and we proposed the promise graph as a tool for debugging promise-based JavaScript code. Um, as future work, which we already started on, we plan to build uh, static and dynamic analyses for building promise graphs so that we can actually automatically perform these studies rather than doing it by hand. And also, we plan to look at the async await uh, construct in ECMAScript 6, which is basically a more disciplined way of writing promise-based uh, JavaScript code. Thank you very much. <laughs>